when we were coming into Clarkston, we didn't know how, how big or what was involved in this. And I remember coming down from Clarkston Road, where you come over the bridge and then come down into the toll. And my eyes were looking over to the right hand side and I could see broken windows and such like, but I thought, well, it doesn't look so bad. But when we come down onto the toll and I turned to the left, then it was just devastation. The whole top of the building had come down the car park, the canopy right along the top had all come right down onto the, onto the ground. I got out and to me the place seemed still. I looked over and um, I saw a young, the young woman on the, I think it was a lamp post she was leaning against. Um, she had her hands over her eyes and there was just blood streaming down all over her, her uh, hands. And I remember looking round and I could see, I could see there was people, there was bodies lying on in the street. It, it, I, I didn't, I, I knew what I was looking at, I knew there was bodies there, but I couldn't register. I, I didn't know if the people were dead or alive. And I remember looking down to the bus stop and I saw the bus, I could see there was people lying um, round about. And then all of a sudden I kind of swept right round. And that was the first sight that I had got of the shops and behind me because I had been facing in that way. I was focused on the the woman and just taking everything in as I went round. And when I actually turned round and I can't tell you the shock, I couldn't work out what had happened, how on earth. And I just remember just a big, sharp intake of breath, just uh, like that. And someone, just at that point, I remember people running up to me um, and saying, are you all right? And I did a U-turn amongst the rubble in front of what I think was the Burma garage in those days. And I just had this panic feeling I had to get out to let the ambulances in. And just as I was approaching my own house, I remembered that there was a doctor who lived a few hundred yards from us and I stopped at their gate. The man and the wife were both doctors, Napiers. And I ran up and banged on their door because I thought that everybody would have heard this bang. And in fact, they hadn't heard anything at all. And I said to her, oh, you must go down to Clarkson, it's dreadful. And she said, oh, it can't be that bad, it can't be that bad. And I said, oh, it is, it's terrible. And uh, within about five, ten minutes, of course, the phone rang and it was a call for all the doctors in the area to go. And she realised that, you know, I wasn't exaggerating what I was saying. I mean, there were obviously terrible lacerations, there were, there were amputations, there was decapitations. It was horrendous. I mean, moving into the toll and seeing the state of devastation, I mean, you, you, you feel looking up on yourself to say, is this true, a man, a wild dream here? I mean, it was like that. You couldn't believe you'd been there maybe 20 minutes before it. I mean, I'm a lucky person, possibly. For, for the man above there, he was on my side that day. I got away with it. But, uh, you know, no, it, was a, it was a terrible thing to get among. It was raining heavily that day, and uh, had that not been the case, my two nephews would have been killed as well, because they were left with a neighbour, purely because of the weather. And uh, he went to the shops with their best friend, who both of them were killed. They weren't together in the shops at the time, I think they had separated to do different shopping. Therefore, Nancy, I believe, was found earlier, well, it must have been, because Carmen was the last body discovered. As I remember it, uh, my sister's watch uh, had stopped at nearly eight o'clock at night and the explosion happened just before three. Therefore, there was some concern in my family about whether she had survived for five hours. I'm not a medical expert, but I do believe that people's watches often stop when they die. And uh, whether that's true or not, it was a bit of a concern in the family that maybe she had been in considerable pain and agony for five hours.
I dialed out the number and my mum picked up the phone and I just, when I heard my mum's voice, I shouted to him, eh, mum, it's me, I'm all right, but, um, but the whole of Clarkston's flat. I didn't have a mark on me, so in that respect, I think I must be one of the luckiest people alive, really. But um, sometimes I think it would have been better if he had had a broken arm or a broken leg or something to show for it. But because um, sometimes I used to have sort of nightmares and wake up and think I had just dreamt it all because I didn't have a mark on me. But um, then when you did go down to Clark's and you realised it, it wasn't a dream at all. It had in fact happened. I can remember seeing the cream cakes in the city bakery's window still. They were not allowed to be moved or anything till after the inquest. And I ran back over to the shop, really expecting to see Helen, Pat. Uh, I, was, I couldn't find any of them. And I, I remember I ran down the street a bit and it was just, that was just total confusion. So I ran back up and on my way back up, my boss came running from the back of the shop and he shouted on me, he saw me and he shouted on me. And he came running uh, up and he said, uh, Catherine, what did Pat, what, do you know what Pat and Helen were wearing this morning? And I said, yes, yes, they both had, they both had the same outfit on, they both had purple jumpers and purple kilts on. And he said, do you know whose shoe that is? And I, I said, yes, uh -huh. and I, I told him whose shoe it was. And he just went, oh, God, like that. I was in my house um, with my two young children, uh, under five, and I heard uh, an explosion. Then I got a phone call to say that something had happened down in Clarkson, so I left my children with a neighbour and I went down to see what happened and realised that there was a, a national disaster, really. and. Um, I tried to get through the barriers because I knew that my sister was probably on her way home. The, the, the devastation was, was just awful. And I went down and the police turned me back because they said that there might be another gas explosion. So I went back. I couldn't get through the barriers. I knew that my sister was there and I had to go back down and find out. I went back down and the the clinic had been taking bodies in there and I tried to look for my sister and then eventually I was turned back again. More than one official has likened the disaster to the Blitz. Glasgow's Lord Provost Sir Donald Liddle said it looked like a direct hit from a £1,000 bomb. And county convener Dr James McFarlane described it as the biggest, the worst disaster in Renfrewshire since the war. It's raining, rescue work goes on, and it will go on right throughout the night. It was the following morning. Um, I had just come down, come downstairs, and the paper had just come through the door, and there was pictures of the the shops in front of the paper and I remember I picked up the paper and I looked at the front of it and saw the shops but then I opened up the inside of the paper and it had some of the dead listed and there was a picture of Pat in that and um, I remember I got really upset just dropped the paper um, and then one of the other papers had a picture of my teddy bear he was our mascot and I had put him into the cubby hole on the Wednesday evening before we left and I picked up the paper and there was a picture of the teddy bear. 